Uh, thank you very much. It's, it's lovely to be here. I'm returning to the theme of the democratic revolution, but more specifically to political reform and the way that has uh, worked out over the last uh, number, of, uh, number of years. Um, I, I want to start really by saying that um, political reform was a very important part of the election campaign and debates before uh, the 2011 general election, but it was at best a minor uh, element uh, for the electorate as a whole. And I think that point sometimes is lost uh, amongst enthusiasts of the, uh, of the debate. All of the political parties uh, produced uh, political reform sections in their manifestos at the last election, and that was noteworthy because it's the first time really in decades that the structures of the political system have uh, received any kind of substantive consideration uh, at an election. And indeed, um, even as academics, we actually put a bit of time into examining these, uh, these proposals, and we came up with a reform scorecard where we looked at the uh, proposals put forward by each of the different political parties, and we scored them under a whole range of different headings, and you've been hearing about many of these topics uh, yesterday and uh, today, earlier today, and for the remainder of the week, so we were interested in things like voter turnout, gender balance, the electoral system, which is a controversial one that we return to uh, over and over again. And then, unsurprisingly, political reform and constitutional reform made it into the program for, uh, the program for government, which contained uh, a commitment to hold five referendums, four of which have already been held, uh, with a 50-50 uh, success rate uh, on that. Um, there were, I suppose, the, the the constitutional reform packages also included uh, a commitment to set up a constitutional convention, and the convention was going to look at um, a whole range of issues, including review of the electoral system, same-sex marriage, the voting age, uh, elements of the, the presidency. The constitutional convention has been established. It sat for more than a year. It examined all of these issues. Uh, at the end of its deliberations, it returned reports to government, and the government has now actually given commitments, and you heard those being restated by Joan Burton earlier this morning, that there are going to be multiple referendums coming up um, in spring of, uh, of uh, next year. Uh, there were, this was the conclusion, if you want, of the constitutional set of uh, proposals. There were a further nine pages of proposals on political reform, including in the program for government, and they were included under seven different headings, and there were 87 different commitments, uh, not all of them entirely distinct, some overlapping themes uh, across them, but an enormous set of commitments um, on uh, political, uh, political reform um, that were going to be implemented. One of the things that we do know from the work of uh, two academics, uh, Rory uh, Costello, who's going to be here with you later in the week, and, and Robert Thompson, is that items that get into the program for government actually have a very high chance of being implemented. So programs for government, as a general rule, are implemented. One of the really interesting things that we know from their work is that there's a huge overlap between the commitments made by the opposition political parties and the government political parties. So the vast majority of the commitments made by the government parties get implemented, but actually a significant minority of the commitments that are made by the opposition parties before the election uh, also get implemented. So it tells us something again about political reform, uh, which is that there's a lot of overlap in terms of the policies that are being put forward by all of the political parties. So that to some extent suggests that there is, a, there is agreement, um, certainly amongst the parties um, in, the, uh, in the Dáil as regards what needs to be, uh, what needs to be done. But at the end of kind of quite a, a long introduction, I suppose, I want to come to kind of the main point, which is that quite a number of the reforms that the government has committed to uh, putting in place uh, have been done. Many more are in track. Yet there is enormous despondency around the debate about political reform. Um, people are really disillusioned. We hear a great deal about the failure of the democratic uh, revolution. And we have to ask why that, is the, uh, why that is the case. And we also have to conduct a rigorous examination of, of what actually has, uh, has occurred. And I'm going to look kind of to, to three different um, uh, arguments. Uh, the first thing is that the political reform debate itself was always an elite debate, um, really contained within uh, the political parties and, and people I suppose, on the margins of the, the political, uh, political system. 
Um, there has been a great lack of clarity with regard to what the goal or the objectives of the democratic revolution actually were. So we hear uh, great things about the democratic revolution, and we all assume that we're all talking about the same democratic revolution going in the same direction. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case, of course. Uh, and then that, of course, ties into another problem, which is there have been very serious flaws in the ways in which the political reform campaigns have actually been communicated themselves. And then I think the final part is, is, is also inevitable, and that is that the kinds of things that we're talking about here, uh, they don't take years to implement. They take decades to be clear and obvious in, in the system. And if some of the reforms actually have worked, um, we should never really notice them uh, at all coming into play, things like transparency and accountability. It should be 10, 15 years down the road, and they should be so embedded in the system that actually we shouldn't really be commenting on them uh, to, uh, to, any great, uh, to any great extent. Um, starting kind of specifically with the idea that uh, it is a, an elite process, I suppose this first thing to say is there's nothing per se wrong with something being an uh, elite discussion. A great many policies come from the elite level, but what's really, I suppose, quite different about political reform is that there is a strong constitutional dimension to it, uh, and it needs, as a, uh, as a result, significant engagement with voters. Um, so the, there has to be, if you want, a, a meeting of minds between um, those in the elite level, uh, those in government, and the voters. They have to match as these proposals work their way through a series, uh, a series of referendums. Um, and, and up to now, I suppose, we, we haven't always acknowledged that there is an opportunity cost for government uh, in terms of dealing with political reform. They have a huge agenda. Uh, and to prioritize political reform is to push something else down the agenda. Uh, and the question is, what else are you pushing down the agenda? And is that something that's more important to voters? Um, we have to keep the preferences uh, of the voters to some extent uh, in, in, in mind. Um, two of the, the reform proposals have failed, the one on extending the powers of uh, committees in the Oireachtas, and the second one was on the, on the Shannet. And uh, there were kind of some early discussions about why that might have been the case. I was involved in the research on the Oireachtas inquiries, one myself, and all of the usual chess notes came up in the research that we did. Um, the campaign was badly run. Uh, the presidential election got all of the attention. You'll be shocked to hear that some people told lies in the course of the referendum campaign. Um, what was interesting about the Shannad referendum is when that was defeated, the government was so disinterested, they didn't even bother doing the research to find the usual face-saving chestnuts as to why the campaign actually failed, uh, failed at all. So it tells us something about the kind of commitment that you have um, to political reform. Uh, why does this matter? Because it, it kind of gets to a, an important point, which is that we don't actually have a huge amount of information about what it is that the voters want to see reformed. Uh, they voted for the, the government in a kind of a general um, set of proposals about constitutional and political reform, but we haven't seen any kind of major steps to actually um, disentangle those and, and to find out particularly what the electorate, uh, electorate do want. We know a couple of things about the electorate, and we've heard some of this mentioned already this morning, and that is that they are growing increasingly disillusioned uh, with politics. Uh, and that is important because it's going to make it more challenging if you want to engage with them in any substantive way. This is just a, a slide which tells us that, um, that great many citizens do not have a lot of confidence in our national parliament. You see that the columns towards the end of the slide are, are larger, uh, and this is uh, telling us that m more people are, if you want, distrustful of Parliament and then have a, a great deal of confidence, which is at the other end. The slides tells us something pretty similar, which is the same, uh, reporting the same information, but here for political parties. Uh, here the case is a little bit more extreme, so you find that political parties are even more distrusted um, than, uh, than Parliament. And this particular slide um, is telling us about political discussion. So how far do people in Ireland actually discuss politics? And it's broken down across three sections, local politics, national politics, and European politics. Now, you will all be surprised to realize this because you clearly talk about politics a great deal. But the audience at McGill is not reflective of the rest of the electorate. And what's interesting here is that actually in all three cases, um, Irish people are less likely to engage in political discussion than our European, uh, our European counterparts. So why does this matter? It matters because it says 
we have challenges ahead if we're going to persuade people of the merits of political reform and if we're going to engage them with the overall conversation about why constitutional change and political reform uh, matters, uh, matters at all. Economic issues dominate at almost every uh, election. Um, the last election was unusual. Um, in having even a small debate, important though it was, about, uh, about political reform. And as we get closer and closer to the next election, those economic issues will move centre stage again, and it's quite likely that these kinds of issues will be crowded, uh, will be crowded out. Mostly I actually work in elections and I do research in two particular areas and there are magic bullets for winning elections in Ireland. It's not a secret. We know what the answer is. You bring down the unemployment rate and you do something about taxes. There is no mention of political reform in there anywhere at all and all of the research for 30 years have uh, told us about um, has told us about um, unemployment and, and taxes. So political reform, to some extent, is, a, is an elite process and one that's really not anchored in any substantive, broad-based um, uh, broad electoral, uh, electoral desire. Uh, if the government really wants to engage the, the, the voters, I suppose, they really have a challenge in terms of communicating effectively with the electorate. And here really we do have to kind of criticize the government because we have five point plans for everything except political reform. We make some efforts to communicate the substance um, of a lot of the proposals uh, in different ways. We had updates regarding the memorandum of understanding. But considering that we're engaging in the most substantive redesign of our political system since 1937, actually very little has been done to communicate the entirety of the uh, plan that we are engaging with. We've been sent plans and leaflets in the post for what to do in an emergency. We have iodine tablets. We have everything and anything that's been sent to us by the government in the past. And really, if we're going to redesign our democracy, you would think that a leaflet might be a starting, uh, might be a starting point. But that does get to the heart of a couple of other problems with the political reform discussion. Uh, the first of those is that responsibility for it is spread across the political system. Technically, Brendan Howland is the Minister for, uh, Minister for Reform. But if we think about the referendums that are coming up uh, next year, we're going to have a whole series of them. The most contentious one is probably going to be on marriage equality. That's going to be handled by Francis Fitzgerald. Um, there's going to be the ones that, of course, we're very interested in as political scientists, lowering the voting age and some other technical voting issues. And we're going to have Alan Kelly out dealing with those. Um, the Constitutional Convention, if you want, which is the kind of main plank of the government's political reform agenda, is managed by the Department of the Taoiseach, so we'll be expecting him to appear somewhere, uh, somewhere in the mix. So the, the entire message of the government's political reform agenda is fragmented across a series of government departments, and it's not entirely clear who's spearheading or who's leading um, this particular, uh, this particular uh, discussion. It brings me to the second kind of major point that I want to make, which is that there is this lack of clarity. And of course, I may have been putting the cart before the horse a little at this point, because I've been somewhat assuming that the government actually has a clear set of ideas about where all of this is going, and they just haven't been telling it to us very effectively. But of course, we do have to kind of tear, uh, break that particular, uh, that particular part down itself. Um, there was a lot of discussion about what the democratic revolution was going to do. We heard it was going to, um, uh, going to restore trust in politics, prevent future crises, create more open and transparent um, political system. I can come up with all kinds of wonderful nuggets, and I imagine that everybody here actually agrees with all of those things. But it's the individual component parts of that, actually, that contribute to those that are the problem. Which specific policies are actually delivering on those broad, ob uh, those broad objectives. So we know what the outcomes are going to be. We can generally agree on what the outcomes are, but the actual pathway and the individual steps along that to getting us to those particular destinations uh, are a good deal less clear. We can identify some obvious ones. Um, the changes in freedom of information are clearly very welcome. Um, the whistleblower legislation uh, will all contribute to uh, improving openness and transparency in the political system. And this is just another graph that I happened to see last week. You can see why we really do need to do some work on kind of openness um, and, and transparency in the political system. Ireland is down there. If you can see, we're at 460, so we're definitely in the bottom half of this particular uh, table. It's just a, a scale 
uh, of not to, to, it's a score of 1,000 for um, open government and data around the world. And we can develop indices and we can give you measures for all different parts of the political, uh, the political system. But what we are actually lacking is an overall integrated plan of the different, um, the different component, uh, component parts. Um, perhaps more worryingly at this point, is when we look at some of the political reforms that actually have been implemented, some of them are inherently contradictory. Uh, and, and that's where we kind of go back to, well, maybe they need to sell their message. Well, then maybe they need to have a much clearer message in terms of what they're doing. So just to pick just a few examples to kind of underscore what we're, we're saying, um, if we start with kind of building trust in politics, well, how do we know or what do we know about building or rebuilding trust in, in politics? We can look to some work that's been done on political finance. 20 years ago, um, most countries actually had very few regulations on political finance. The last 20 years has witnessed all over the world enormous changes in this area. We have very significant disclosure requirements. Some countries have contribution limits. And there are a great many restrictions now with regard to political finance. But the research that's been done quite recently by a, a woman named Susan Scarrow has found that voters across the world in a, in a European study, um, sorry, an OECD study, uh, are actually now more convinced than ever that politics is at its most corrupt point ever. So even though we spent a great deal of time actually improving the regulations and trying to build trust and improving uh, the whole context of party finance, voters are not persuaded. Um, so we need to think about the kinds of things that we're doing uh, to build, uh, build trust because they may not, uh, they may not work. Uh, the second thing is if we stick with party finances, that a lot of the opinion polls uh, have been telling us that voters want a new political party. Now, in general, we're all in favor of uh, more restrictions and better monitoring of party finance and political finance. But one outcome of the changes in political finance is that it's going to be much more difficult for new political parties to come forward because it's going to be far more difficult for them to actually get finance, to get donations, uh, to become operational um, in the first place. So I don't think any of us are going to argue against party finance, um, uh, cleaning up party finance and ensuring that there's better standards in, in uh, politics, but we do have to be conscious of the fact that some of the changes we make will have other consequences, um, uh, which may make things more difficult. If we look at gender quotas, again, um, we've spent a lot of time complaining about the, the, the pale, stale, male nature of, uh, of Irish uh, politics. So the gender quotas were quite welcome. But if we look at the other steps that the government took in tandem in reducing the number of seats in the Dáil, abolishing the town councils, uh, trying to get rid of the Shannad, what they actually were doing was limiting the number of political opportunities within the political system at a time when they were trying to bring more women into the system. So they were doing one thing on one side, which on the other hand, their other policies were going to make it more difficult to achieve. So bringing more women into politics is about creating more opportunities in politics. If you're reducing it, you're going to increase the overall tensions um, within, the, within the system. Executive dominance, we were told, was a big, uh, was a big problem, and doll activity has been increasing. You can see here the doll sitting hours has gone up since 2011. The doll sitting days have gone up. This particular table tells us that we're dealing with more, more legislation. Um, so activity is on the increase, but at the same time, we have very serious concerns uh, about um, the intensity of the activity that is, uh, that is taking place. Uh, I'll finish off, I suppose, with a kind of a, a smaller point, which is that, um, well, I, I suppose we should say that, you know, the law of unintended consequences hangs over everything we do. It's not a reason to not proceed with policies, to not proceed with political reform uh, proposals. But it is a caution to us to step back a little bit and look at the entirety of the proposals um, before we engage in any steps um, that might kind of prove counterproductive uh, or may not actually achieve the objectives that we, uh, that we set for ourselves. For anybody who peruses the program for government, as I have to do from time to time, you will see that the, um, 
political and constitutional reform proposals were copied and pasted from the respective Labour and Fine Gael manifestos because the font changes between the different sections and it was done reasonably quickly so you can see where, uh, where, each, one, uh, where each one came from. So perhaps there is a case to be made uh, for looking at the entirety of the, of the proposals uh, and uh, thinking about the kind of broader consequences and also having a kind of a clear sense of what it is that we plan to achieve. Uh, the last thing really is, is just to say that most of these things will take a very long time to work where, their way through, uh, through the political system. Uh, it's, it's not to, I suppose, um, um, kind of take us away from our, our main focus, but we do have to be conscious of the fact that political systems change very slowly over time. We have evolved from a kind of a two and a half party system through to a, a multi-party system, um, much more flexible voting behaviour, significant political uh, cultural change, but all of this happens over decades uh, rather than a single electoral cycle. So in terms of evaluating the kind of steps that have been taken, we need to, I think, take a, a long term look at it to see whether or not the democratic revolution has actually happened and it could indeed be 30 years before we will be able to answer that particular question.